Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord.
reading, a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which meant teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Easter Sunday. So when modern writers talk about the resurrection, they usually do so as if it's a one-time moment in history characterized by the discovery of the empty tomb. Kind of the same way we celebrate Easter Sunday as the church certainly reinforces the notion by setting today apart with all the great music and finery and making it the one day when just about everyone goes to church. <laughs> Christianity has perhaps unintentionally suggested that the resurrection was a singular event. Think February 22nd, 1732, George Washington's birthday. April 26, 1865, when Joseph Johnson surrendered to William Tecumseh Sherman just down the road at Bennett Place. Or July 21, 1969, when Neil Armstrong took his first step on the moon. But interestingly, this is not how the resurrection is described in the New Testament, not at all. According to the Gospels, the resurrection was a whole series of events that occurred over a six or seven week period. It didn't happen all at once, but was a reality that was revealed over time. That's why the church has always referred to Easter as a season and why the next six Sundays are known as the Sundays of Easter. Trying to understand the resurrection by looking at the empty tomb story is a bit like trying to understand a whole book by reading only the first chapter. The story's not all there yet. 
For example, the great joy and sense of victory that we so wonderfully punctuates today's celebration isn't found in the story of the empty tomb at all. That'll come later in the next chapters, in the next weeks, as the community of faith begins to understand and experience firsthand the resurrected Lord. We're there with Thomas when he says, place your hands here and feel my wounds. And who eats breakfast with the disciples on the beach. What characterizes today's gospel is not a sense of celebration, but a profound confusion. Easter begins not in joy, but with confusion at the tomb. Peter Gomes, the once chaplain at Harvard University, made a simple yet poignant point about the resurrection. He said the resurrection is God's way of getting our attention, God's way of getting us to listen up. The empty tomb certainly got Mary's attention. Like you and me, Mary is preoccupied with her thoughts, perhaps worried about the roast in the oven or the guests or both. Her private grief, personal agenda, memories, expectations, and fears are suddenly interrupted by God in a mighty way. Wham! She walks right up into an empty tomb. It's a total, terrible surprise. Life begins, Peter Gomes says, when God gets our attention. Life begins for Mary when she was forced to leave behind the grave of her old expectations, that the good always dies young, that injustice and violence rule the world, that there is life, but it's only a bitter little pill. At first, Mary experiences the empty tomb as a more terrible insult added to injury. They have stolen the Lord, taken his body out of the tomb, she said to the disciples. Even after encountering two angels inside the tomb, Mary still doesn't get it. Finally, the Lord himself appears to her. At first, she thinks he's the gardener. But then he tells her, Mary, why are you weeping? Suddenly, she grasps the significance of the experience. God got her attention. And she tells the other that she has seen the Lord. I think what we have here is the first and incredible Easter story from John is a story about a resurrection of Jesus and how that extraordinary event begins to transform the lives of those who follow him. It's not only Jesus' body that gets raised on Easter morning, it's Mary's life and the disciples, they are also getting raised. John wants his readers to grasp that there is a new force in the world with the power to overcome death and to bring new life to all those who believe. In John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene is found visiting the tomb of Jesus only to find the stone rolled away. Her immediate reaction is to run to Simon Peter and to John. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. This news is disheartening, and so is now Peter and John who turn to run. The Gospel's description has a race feeling it seems proud to claim that John is the first to reach the tomb, the younger after all. Although John leans down to view the inside of the tomb, he does not go in. It's Peter who upon his arrival who enters the tomb first. Only then does John enter and he saw and he believed and their lives were changed forever. The cross events is critical in the disciples' understanding of who Jesus is. All four Gospels indicate the disciples' difficulty in understanding Jesus' parables, Jesus' healing, and Jesus' predictions of the cross. Even Jesus mentions that only the resurrection will bring understanding to the disciples. It takes this event, this resurrection, to clarify who Jesus is and the nature 
of God. Jesus came to liberate us from death. Our God is a God of life. As shocking as this experience must have been, Peter and John leave Mary Magdalene standing outside the tomb, and she stays there weeping. Now is their moment. She's all alone. Now it's Mary's turn to peer into the tomb. And there she sees two angels. Woman, why are you weeping, they ask. Mary expressed her fear that someone has taken Jesus' body to the angels. At that moment, she turned to see a man standing behind her whom she thought to be a gardener. He repeated the angel's question, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? So she began to accuse the man of taking the body when he called her name, Mary. We are known by our name. We are known by what we are called. And she knew the way he said her name. For it was at that moment that Mary knew this to be Jesus. She wanted to embrace him, but Jesus said, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary becomes the first to share the story of the resurrection. James and John, they heard it. The story doesn't say anything about them going on to tell about it. It was Mary. She can't help herself but to tell everyone she saw, I have seen the Lord. Charles Dickens' immortal classic, A Christmas Carol, is one of the best Easter stories in a non-biblical literature. Kind of caught you by surprise on that one. <laughs> the story may take place at Christmas time and be one we traditionally tell at Christmas. It even has Christmas in its title. But it's not about Christmas. Instead, it's all about Easter. Think about it. The story describes the transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge, a man whose old life, characterized by pettiness and greed, is transformed into a new life characterized by giving and joy. And Scrooge finds himself at the site of a tomb when it finally takes place, too. When the phantom shows Scrooge his grave, the old is shattered by the reality of what he sees. His face becomes, as Dickens tells it, and I quit, quote, wet with tears. Kind of like Mary. And the piercing remorse smashes through him, exposing the childlike soul buried for so very long. That's a resurrection story, plain and simple. Dickens may have said it at the Christmas season and evoked vicious Christmas stories as a catalyst for change. But what he describes is nothing less than the force that Mary and Peter and so many others throughout history, including many of us whose lives have been altered, encountering the Easter miracle. It is the force of Christ risen from the dead. This morning, this first morning of the Easter season, we are reminded of something very important. Veiled by all the finery and the celebration, the bunny rabbits and the colored Easter eggs, before it blooms into joy, resurrection will always appear amidst chaos when we are confounded by grief and despair or pierced through the heart by some terrible remorse. So if you've come here today to be convinced of the meaning of an empty tomb, don't be surprised if you leave knowing little more than Mary when she first arrived there. Why should you know more? You have to look further into the Easter story and into the lives of everyday people. 
and the church can help. We can show you a multitude of lives transformed, a whole host of people who have died any number of emotional and spiritual deaths and yet live on joyfully in the power of God. I can show you a surgeon who has changed from a self-described, mean-spirited, uptight, brilliant professor who once enjoyed life into a fun-loving, compassionate father almost overnight. I can show you a person whose life has gone down the drain following a painful divorce who suddenly finds an inner strength and sense of hope that never dreamed possible. I can show you a young insurance salesman with an alcohol problem who is now an Episcopal bishop. I can show you a lawyer named Augustine who dabbled in cultic worship when he wasn't chasing women, but whom God transformed into a father of modern theology. I can show you a hot-headed fisherman named Peter who became the rock of a church when it was founded. And I can show you an enslaver named John who through the power of forgiveness penned a hymn called Amazing Grace. I could go on and on mentioning some who are famous and some whom you've never heard of. And you could probably do the same for me. But in all cases, it's the same thing repeatedly. Individuals who were once despairing, disillusioned and perplexed, but became by the power and grace of God, joyful, purposeful, and infused with hope. As Paul says, we are witness to these things when we begin to understand resurrection. So yes, resurrection begins in the tomb. That's where God gets our attention. And it's his risen life is first revealed. But there's more to come. Welcome to the season of the resurrection. Turning in your bulletin, let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God.
using the prayers of the people, form three, found on page 387 of the Book of Common Prayer. Father, remembering especially Abundant Life Greensboro, All Saints Greensboro and Church of the Holy Spirit Greensboro, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. Remembering especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Samuel and Jennifer, our bishops, Sandy, Katie, and Stephen, our priest. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Remembering especially Joe, our president, Roy, our governor, Nita, the chair of our county commissioners, and Leo, our mayor. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Remembering those who have been commended to our prayers, especially Brianna, Denise, Elena, Judy, Rena, Ruth, Tammy, and Tom. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Remembering especially Helen de Benedet, given to the departed, give to the departed eternal rest. Remembering especially St. Stephen, we praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for those in the parish observing birthdays during the coming week, especially Becky Buckley, Emmy Rehnquist, and Sidney DuPont. And for those observing anniversaries, especially Julie and Myron Simmons. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask all these things for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. We thank you for joining us and happy Easter. If you come seeking the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, know that this altar is for you, for it is God's altar and not our own. If when you come to the altar, if you're not wanting to receive Eucharist but wish to receive a blessing, then we invite you to come forward, just make the sign of the cross and we'll give you a blessing instead. Speaking of blessings, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries in our midst?
Good morning. Will you introduce yourself to the congregation? Welcome. Let us pray. Watch over these, your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them where they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their heart, may your peace, which passes all understanding, abide in them the remainder of their days. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. So before the final hymn, I'm going to invite all of the children to come forward. So at that time, moms and dads, if they have their Easter baskets, then I invite you to send them up with their Easter baskets. I'm going to send them out by age groups so that there's not a complete rush. <laughs> uh, so I'll also ask some of our parents to uh, help us out in the back to disperse them along the way. It will be a, uh, a quick process. <laughs> we hope that they will uh, enjoy their time, but we're gonna try and make it so that the little ones have a little bit of joy just as much as the older ones as well. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering, a sacrifice unto God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to bring the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, our Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ have taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us stand and let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and to serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in him which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. May I please have all the children to come forward at this time. I invite you to bring up baskets. If you don't have your baskets, we have some to offer up to you as well. But I invite the children to come forward at this time. Good morning. Y'all have a seat on the steps real quick. Everybody sit down. Good morning. Let's have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Is this all of our children? Parents, please be seated. So when we go out this morning, are we going to rush around, knocking people down, taking care of their eggs, or are you going to take care of just your own space, right? It's about generosity. It's about being nice to each other, right? No competition whatsoever. There are plenty of eggs for everyone. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to let you go by the youngest to the oldest. I will pace you out, so we'll slow this down. But the secret is this. You can't go until Mr. Jeremy says that you can go, okay? So he's going to wait around here for, I don't know, a while, right? He's, he's going to wait, and then he's going to send you all off as well. So when I ask you to go by your ages, you're just going to go to the back, but you're not going to go outside, right? You're going to go into the back of the church, right? And you're just going to kind of wait there. You can start looking for eggs. I'm sure nobody saw any on their way in. <laughs> so when you get there... Jeremy is going to help you to know what ages can go where. So that's part of the reason we want you to hold back a little bit, okay? So let's start with our youngest. So who is under one? I think there's some manipulation going on here. Who's two? I think mommy can take number two. There we go. You want to take her? Just right out to the north X. That's great. Hey, sweetie. You want to come down? Come on. Nope. Okay. I'm going to go on this side. <laughs> She'll be all better when she sees the eggs. <laughs> Three-year-olds. Do we have any three-year-olds? Okay. All right, you ready? Well, you you want to head on out? Three-year-olds, there we go. Four-year-olds. All right. Now we're building up momentum. Five-year-olds. Five-year-olds. There we go. <laughs> Ten-year-olds. Twelve-year-olds. Who am I missing? Thirteen-year-olds. Fifteen-year-olds. Seventeen-year-olds. Wait. Who am I missing? Six-year-olds. Ten-year-olds. Seven-year-olds. Eight-year-olds. Nine-year-olds. And anybody else? 
Okay, Jeremy, you want to go send them on their way? We're going to wait for the hymn. Oh, boy. I thought, I thought the confession time was over. <laughs> Our final hymn, please, Bob. Let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen.